we're just going to keep the uh, good times rolling here because we're going to hear from a futurist who is optimistic about the future. So how cool is that? So please welcome co-chair of Energy Environment and Environment from Singularity University, Ramez Nam. Welcome, Ramez. Thanks for having me here. It's great to be here. So as you heard, I'm an optimist. I run the Energy and Environment Program at Singularity University. I have uh, written a book on clean tech. I invest in uh, seed stage startups in clean tech. And despite everything terrible happening in the world, I believe that we're going to come out of this probably OK. So how can I even think that way? Well, I started my book on energy and environment with this quote. Who knows what this is from? Just shout it out. A tale of two cities. Exactly. And a tale of two cities, it's like today we have a tale of two planets, right? Some of us can say this is the best time to be alive on planet Earth, and others can say it's actually a terrible time right now. And you can make a case for either. The case for best of times is actually pretty straightforward. If you look at metrics of human suffering, poverty, hunger, warfare, disease, all of these, they are all at all-time lows on planet Earth today. If you look at metrics we associate with good things, with human flourishing, how long we live, how many years of education we get, can we read and write, all of these things, they're all at all-time highs today. And they've all soared over the last 40 or 50 years. Right. Who knows what this is? It's a city. This is Shanghai about 40 years ago. And here it is today. Right? It's night and day. This reflects the uplift of not just people in Shanghai, not just people in China, but billions of people around the world from an almost 19th century existence to a 21st century existence. And that's what this is ha happening right now, is this massive uplift of human well-being. So how can we possibly say that it's the worst of times? Well, this is also Shanghai. Right? There's this intimate relationship between the resources that we need to flourish and the environment that we live in. Air pollution like this kills 5 million people a year around the world, we believe, right now. And that's not the only resource that's under pressure in some way. We need to grow 70% more food by the middle of the century to keep up with rising demand, largely for meat. Almost the only place we could expand farms into are the world's forests. They house three quarters of the on-land biodiversity. They filter and purify water and air for us. And we've already cut down half of the original forest of the planet. And almost all deforestation today is to grow crops for food or for energy or to graze animals. Or water. We live in a water world, right? But here again, we have problems. 70% of the world's use of fresh water is also to grow food. It's not your shower, it's not your dishes, it's really the food that we eat. And this insatiable demand to grow more food and to consume more fresh water has led to catastrophes like this. Anyone know what this is? This is the Aral Sea. It's the fourth largest body of fresh water in the world, or it was. This is between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. But even in the US, we have the Ogallala Aquifer that's dropping in some places by three feet per year, uh, underwater reservoir of fossil water. Right? So the problems are huge, and they're all exacerbated by this one, climate change. 2014 was the hottest year on record. 2015 blew that away by a very large jump. 2016 is almost certainly going to be the hottest year as well. January 1st, 2016, at the North Pole, it was above freezing. That's not normal. 30 degrees Fahrenheit normer, warmer than normal at the North Pole. So we have a very, very serious issue. Okay? So how the heck can I be an optimist when all these terrible things are happening? Well, I'll give you two reasons. One is we've beaten problems like this before. This is the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland. It's a nice, lovely, bucolic place. But it didn't always look like this. In the late 1960s, this was the Cuyahoga River. You could stick your hand into the river and bring it out covered with oil and chemicals. The surface of the, lip of the river was littered with debris. And that's because 
the river was surrounded by factories and warehouses that situated themselves there because it offered low-cost transportation services and zero-cost waste disposal. You've got some used oil, dump it into the river, zero cost to you, right? Some cost to somebody living downstream, perhaps. Now, all of this went on until in 1969, a train crossed this river, and its metal wheel on the metal train track drew a spark, and the spark drifted down onto the surface of the river, and the Cuyahoga River caught on fire. Now, this was actually the 13th time, we believe, that the Cuyahoga River caught on fire. The 12th time was during World War II, but this woke America up, and then things changed. This is the Cuyahoga River today. 27 of the 30 fish species that were gone from the river are now back. You can drink out of it. And we didn't sacrifice growth. Cleveland has three times the GDP it did in 1969. Per capita income has doubled. We just changed the rules of the game and innovated. Or air pollution, smog. 1960s New York City looked like Shanghai or Shenzhen. Los Angeles looked like this. In the early 1960s, the air in London caught on fire. Right? And now you go to any of these global metropolises in the Western world and you have an experience like this. And that's what we'll see, I believe, in China and India uh, years or decades down the road. Or the ozone layer. Anyone here remember the ozone hole? Why don't we talk about that a whole lot anymore? It's, it's not closed, but it has hit its minimum and it is bouncing back. This is a NASA projection that by 15, 20 years from now, it will be almost fully recovered. It takes decades to build up new ozone. But we stopped the bleeding. And in fact, we knew that chemicals like freon, coolants, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, were destroying ozone, and we had to get rid of them. Industry said it could not be done. It would cost hundreds of billions of dollars. Your air conditioner wouldn't work. People would die because medicines would go bad on the shelves in hospitals. But we just did it. We signed something called the Montreal Protocol. In about a decade, we phased out the use of CFCs and created a multi-billion dollar market for non-ozone depleting coolants. So we've done that before. That's one reason that I'm optimistic. The second reason is that the, the crux we heard this uh, question of, is sustainability just clean energy? No, but energy is the most important of these resources. And in energy, we have an abundance of clean energy. The world's use of energy would be, if expressed in oil, 16 cubic kilometers of oil, more than a Bay Area of oil, right? But that is swamped by the continual influx of energy from the fusion reactor in the sky, which hits us with 10,000 times more energy each day at the top of the atmosphere than we use from all sources combined. That means that one day of civilization's energy needs is met by just 10 seconds of the sunlight hitting the top of the atmosphere. One year of our energy needs is met by just one hour of the sunlight hitting the top of our atmosphere. There's no shortage of energy. It's just an issue of capturing it. Nor is there a shortage of land. With current efficiency solar panels, less than a third of a percent of the world's land area suffices to meet all of our energy needs. It's entirely been an issue of cost, of economics. And that cost is changing rapidly. You've all seen this, but let's put it in perspective. This is on a log scale. The cost of a watt of solar power has dropped by a factor of 200 over the last 40 years. Nothing in physical infrastructure ever gets cheaper that fast. Nothing does except for IT and solar power and batteries, actually. And now we're experiencing crossover. By crossover, I mean we are now seeing solar wind unsubsidized deals beating out all other energy technologies, right? Cost of a new natural gas plant in the US, seven and a half cents a kilowatt hour. China, one gigawatt plant being built at six cents, no subsidies. India, a four gigawatt plant being built in Rajasthan, the Sambar Ultra plant, 4.6 rupees a kilowatt hour, about six cents a kilowatt hour. Grid parity prices there. In the US, solar deal prices have dropped by about a factor of five over the last eight years. The city of Palo Alto, just a few miles from here, signed a 3.6 cent per kilowatt hour deal with a plant outside of LA. Some subsidies there, probably about 5.1 cents, still cheaper than any other technology. Mexico, power auction earlier uh, this year in March, five cent average, three and a half cent, completely unsubsidized, lowest cost that came in. 
right? It comes down to economics. Energy is fungible. People are going to buy the cheapest energy, and solar is becoming that. This is my favorite of these pictures. In Dubai, 800 megawatt plant being built. A Saudi firm, Aqua Power, won the bid for one of these tranches. 2.99 cents. That was the world record for not just the cheapest solar ever, but the cheapest electricity ever sold everywhere in the world. That was in May. That record held for about three months till in August, Chile beat that with 2.91 cents. And then two days ago, it was broken again. I didn't even have a new slide for it. In Abu Dhabi, a 2.4 cent per kilowatt hour solar deal with no subsidies. That's one third the price of a new natural gas or coal plant. This is a disruption happening. And we talked about these other issues, poverty. There's 1.3 billion people alive that don't have electricity. Where do they live? They live in some of the sunniest parts of the world where solar will be cheapest. So what's the world's country that's going to have the most expanse of its energy use over the next few decades? India. India, also sunnier than most of the rest of the world. So this is fundamentally good news. And now we can talk about this crazy idea. The cost of energy throughout history has fluctuated, mostly trended down, but fluctuated. The cost of technology always goes down. It only goes in one direction. We've always assumed that clean energy was more expensive energy, but now we can start talking about clean energy as being cheaper energy than dirty energy. Even very conservative organizations like the IEA say that. Let me show you how conservative the IEA is. Here's the IEA's history of projections of solar growth. Dark blue is how fast solar has actually grown. And you see in 2002, they had a forecast. 2004, they said, oh, we're a little bit off, lifted a little bit. Uh, 2006, oh, we're a little bit off, lifted a little bit. I think it might be a cut and paste from uh, previous cells uh, using that macro again. So who thinks in 2014 they've got it right? Well, this is the International Energy Agency, the world's experts on energy. I don't see a lot of confidence out there. You all know who the butt of my joke is, of course, because solar is already lifting off that line. They project flat installations per year. Installations grew 43% this year. And even the IEA says solar will be the largest source of electricity by mid-century, and it will be unbeatable in cost. UBS, financially interested only, now says renewables are deflationary to energy prices in the US. Alliance Bernstein, private equity firm, put out this report to their clients. No, they're not environmentalists. This is simply a financial analysis. They called this graph, Welcome to the Terror Dome. This is two years ago. Across the bottom, you have the cost of coal, gas, and oil in the US. If it was a little bit later, it had come down a little bit. And I think somebody's kid took a crayon and scrawled on this chart. Right? Is that what happened in the, the upper right? That's the cost of solar plunging. And if we put the cost of wind on here, it's a slightly slower slope, but it's still massively disruptive. And if you put the price of batteries on here, it's the exact same slope as solar. This is a technological disruption happening in the $6 trillion energy industry. And it's not just limited to electricity. It, now it's hitting this sector, transportation. The Saudi oil minister during the 1970s crisis, Sheikh Yamani, said the Stone Age didn't end for the lack of stone. Right? It ended because we invented bronze tools. We, the oil age will end with oil still in the ground. He was warning his fellow princes that the world is going to invent technology to replace the use of oil. And we're doing it. Two or three years ago, I was not convinced. Now I'm convinced. The electrification of transport is going to happen. And this is a radical thing to say, because electric vehicles are 0.1% of the vehicles on the road today. One billion vehicles, only one million are electric. They're a rounding error. You cannot spot their influence anywhere in transportation energy use. But they are growing at 60% per year. And that's what wins in the long run, is that massive growth rate and the massive drop in prices. People didn't see this coming, but Tesla, and not just Tesla, GM, $35,000 vehicle. The median new vehicle in the US is a Toyota Camry at $33,000. This is a luxury vehicle that drives like a Porsche and is priced like a Camry and can go 200 miles. 
right? Now again, I'm going to pick on, on government forecasters. The EIA, full of good people that I love, uh, this is their forecast for how many electric vehicles will be on the road. The blue line is how many vehicles with a 100-mile range will be on the road in the US, not annual sales, cumulative. The red line is how many electric vehicles with a 200-mile range will be on the road. And if you can't see the red line, I, I forgive you, it's about 10,000 total, they thought, would be sold in all the years to 2040. Tesla sold 300,000 in the first week of the Model 3 and is on track to sell half a million per year. And that's just one manufacturer. It's not a secret sauce that Tesla has. It's just the curve of this technology. And then you have a virtuous cycle. Batteries are exponential like solar. They drop in price as they scale. As you sell more EVs, you sell more batteries. The price of batteries drops. The price of your EV drops. You sell more EVs, and on and on. And the craziest thing I will tell you today, maybe, is that electric vehicles are destined to be the cheapest vehicles, because this is the entire drivetrain of an electric vehicle, 90% fewer moving parts than an internal combustion vehicle. And if you play out what that math looks like, it looks like electric vehicles being cheaper than a two-seater smart car, which is the green line here, by some point in the not too distant future. Energy is the biggest of these, but it's not the only resource. Water, we know we consume too much fresh water. How many of you know that per capita in the US, we're back down to 1930s levels of water consumption? because our farming has gotten more efficient and our industry has gotten more efficient. And how many know that the amount of energy it takes to desalinate water has dropped by an order of magnitude, a factor of 10, since the 1970s? Right? Or food, we have to grow a lot more food. The world is growing more food, and a lot of it is energy access. Rich countries grow more food because they have tractors and fertilizer. As we get that energy access out, we'll see our food consumption go up. And if we think about our footprint on the planet, we all know that our footprint is growing, right? But our population is topping out, and our per capita footprint may shrink. In our hunter-gatherer era, it took 3,000 acres to feed one human being. Today, it takes about one-third of one acre to feed one human being, a 10,000x reduction in the land that we need. We can peak our resource utilization even as we grow our well-being and our wealth around the world. Now, I don't want to delude you. This is a race. It's not that technology is a silver bullet or a magic pixie dust is going to solve all problems. We have very serious problems, and we have this tool that we can use. And it's not clear we're winning the race yet. This is the Paris uh, voluntary agreements of the colored areas here, and how fast we have to drop our carbon emissions is the black line. We have to turn faster, we have to push harder. But I believe we can do it, and I believe it for this reason. This is ILIAC, one of the world's first digital computers, and that's a smartphone. ILIAC, about the size of this room, weighed hundreds of tons, drew tens of megawatts of power. This weighs tens of grams and is millions of times more powerful. If you tried to make something as powerful as my phone with ILIAC technology, it would have a footprint larger than San Francisco, be miles tall, use all of California's electricity, and it still couldn't play Angry Birds or Pokemon Go or take a selfie. That's because this is not made of matter. This is not made of steel or glass or rare earth elements. This is made of ideas. This is made of scientific discoveries, engineering breakthroughs, and the right idea can multiply any resource. It can reduce the need for any resource. And ideas never chip, they never break, and they always spread and multiply. They're the one natural resource we always have more of over time. And that, fundamentally, is why I'm an optimist. Thank you very much.